in Southland. Uh, we are thrilled to have a baby to be dedicated today. The whole family has come to be part of this. Um, and, I'm, and I'm thrilled that Spencer and Mackenzie Dillman are here to bring James August Dillman uh, before the Lord, before the church, and before the altars of the church. Uh, Spencer and Mackenzie, this is what the word of the Lord says in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Repeat them again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away on a journey and when you are lying down and when you are getting up again. Today's a big, important moment when you come to the Lord and say, we recognize this child that James August is a gift from God. Actually, the psalmist says that in Psalm 127. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. And so today, as you present him to the Lord, I'm gonna ask you, uh, is this moment a moment where you are pledging to raise James, James August Dillman in the love of the Lord, in the word of God, and in the worship of Jesus? If so, answer, we will. get you all settled in so you can go back to sleep. James August Dillman, I anoint you with oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gift that James is to his parents. And we pray that in this moment, as they present him to you before this church, we ask, oh Lord, you would bless him that you would fill his parents with your Holy Spirit and you would cause them to want nothing more than for him to know you and love you and trust you. So today we give him to you for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now will all of you, by God's grace, do everything in your power to come alongside Spencer and Mackenzie to raise up James to love the Lord. If so, answer, we will. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's, that's the way to start a service. We just stand with us together. Let's sing this song together, please. of Christ my King through eternal ages let His praises ring glory in the highest I will shout and sing standing on the promises of God Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God.
In this study, we'll learn different ways that apply to your character and your, your personality and the things that uh, really would uh, appeal to you, ways that you personally can lead someone to Christ. So I encourage you, next Sunday night, we'll start gathering, and uh, we'll remind you again next Sunday, we have participants' guides for everyone. Uh, there's no charge for the class. You can sign up in the hub. If you don't sign up, you can still come. Uh, we're hoping for a great crowd. We'll have a great time. It's not just a lecture. I'm not just, I'm not a kind of a teacher, but we'll have a good time learning together and what the Lord might have for us. So I encourage you to think it through, pray about it, and plan to be there next Sunday night. As we come to prayer, I was reminded this week, this morning early, if there was some way to look out into the crowd and realize the needs that exist in every heart in life, it would probably be overwhelming, wouldn't it? Everyone comes today with a need. Everyone has issues in their lives. Everyone has joys and testimonies. Everything has good things in their lives, and they also have difficult times. So it is this morning we come to this time of prayer, and what an incredible privilege just to come before the Lord and talk to Him. Let's quiet our hearts and bow our heads. Father, You are our light and our salvation. Whom should we fear? You are the stronghold of our life. Who should we be afraid? When evil men come against us to devour our flesh, they will stumble and fall. You say to wait upon you, to trust in you. And so it is today, we trust in you. And we thank you, Father, for the joys we have, for the joy of serving you. Thank you, Father, for the joy of salvation. Thank you, Father, for saving us and for touching us and helping us and strengthening us. Thank you for safety and health and goodness and grace. We pray today that there are no doubt a, a lot of needs in this congregation and we lift those to you as they are praying even in this moment and we pray, Lord, that you would satisfy that need and meet the need according to your will. Thank you, Father, again for the trust that we can have in you, for the way you've met needs in our lives today, throughout the week, the way you'll do things in this coming week. Father, you have a desire to touch us more than we want to be touched, to save us more than we want to be saved, to heal us more than we want to be healed. And we trust in that this morning. I lift Steve to you. He has an awesome task to bring the word of God to the people that sit before him today to hear God's word. We're not here to hear Steve. We're here to hear you. And we pray, God, that you would anoint him and let him speak your word today in a way that only he can do. We thank you, Father, for the truth and the fervency and the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And all of God's people said, Would you sing this with us, please? Come, every soul, by sin oppressed, there's mercy.
last song together, please. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits song. Heaven's mercy sing. Sing that again. As a hen protects her young beneath her wings. But Jerusalem wouldn't let you. 
Am I any different? Your own children killed your prophets. They stoned your messengers. Can I claim any innocence? Your word is my light. But how often do I choose the darkness instead? You are my salvation. But how often do I choose rebellion? Forgive me, Lord. You are my fortress. I seek to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in you, Lord. Meditating on your word, Lord. Be merciful and answer me, Lord. Do not turn your back. Do not reject me in anger. You are my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, Lord. Hold me close. Teach me how to live. Amen. I don't know what your parents were like, but uh, my mother uh, had to repeat things often to me. Uh, and even then, when I got them, I repeated them back to her when she knew for sure that I had them down, uh, inevitably I would forget them as I lived my life and she would have to review. Do you have to have to review with your kids? Uh, did your parents ever have to review with you? Uh, that's why around here at Southland, we, we try our best to keep the main things, the important things before you all the time. We try to review, for instance, our mission statement, uh, being and making growing followers of Jesus Christ. We, we try to explain to you what that is, what, it, what is a growing follower of Jesus. And so we have the mission statement on the wall. We have the four Gs on the wall, that you've experienced God's grace, that you're growing in that grace, that you're giving of yourself and your resources to his work, and you're going and sharing your faith. That's what a growing follower of Jesus is. Well, then we also have at Southland 10 core values. These are our non-negotiables. These are the things that build the foundation of everything we are and everything we believe in and everything we ultimately do in ministry. And it's been a while since I reviewed those with you. And so we're going to spend the next 10 weeks focused in on these 10 core values because they're exceedingly important, not just to us as a church, but honestly, I've tried to use these 10 core values as foundational in my own life, in my walk with Christ, and in the way I interact with my family, my friends, my community, my colleagues. I hope that this will be a challenging and encouraging series for you. And so today, I'm going to take you back to a passage that we just dealt with this past fall, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, and, it, and we're going to go to chapter 4. Now, uh, excuse me, chapter 3. Right out of the gate today, I'm going to maybe say something controversial and, and maybe for some even offensive just to lay the groundwork here. That's what you want to hear, right? Yeah, please. That, that's how I want you to start the sermon, Steve. Get me all dialed in by offending me. Well, what would you do if you heard that this week I'm going to conduct a marriage ceremony in this sanctuary for one man and two women? Now, now what would you do at that moment? Would you, would you get up and leave and never come back? Well, why? Why would you get up and leave and never come back? Would you celebrate that progressive ideology and that I've reached the 21st century and beyond? And, and, and why would you celebrate that? Why would it be right for you, good for you, to think that that would be a good thing for me to do? Well, for the record, I won't be performing a marriage like that this week. So for those of you who would be offended, relax. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But why? Why is it not going to happen? Our first core value, that we believe the Bible is the Word of God, and that it is our standard for belief and life practice. And so that's why everything we do here at Southland starts with the Word of God. And, 
And, and let me just remind you so that you understand where this passage that we're going to read and unpack today comes from. Paul is in prison. He's near the end of his life. These are maybe some of his final words that he ever wrote in the Bible that we read to his friend and protege, Timothy. And he wanted to make sure that Timothy was equipped with truth to deal with the immense pressure that was on him and the people of his church. He's just a young pastor. And he's trying to teach the people what it is to follow Christ and what it is to live a godly life under that immense pressure to conform to cultural ideas. And so Paul uses the letter to expose imposters, those who would teach things that weren't anything near what God had designed for us. And he challenges Timothy then to never give up preaching this gospel, this truth. And so if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll begin the reading today with verse 14. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, I want to focus on those last two verses this morning to unpack this core value to us as a church and, I hope, to you in your life. Here it is again. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Now, really, there are, are, are three things that just jump out at me, and there probably are a lot more, even in that small phrase, that one sentence. And here is the first. Scripture is the authority on what is true. Scripture is. Now, how do we decide what is true? Now, some people will say, well, evidence. You know, I've got a, a, a pile full of evidence that convinces me that whatever it is I'm thinking about is, in fact, right or true. But to, ter to determine if something is historically true, we must have a trustworthy record, a reliable source upon which we build our confidence in that truth. That's why the Christian faith is so dependent upon the Bible. We believe these 66 books we call the Old Testament and the New Testament are inspired by God, his voice to us of what is true and good and best and right. And how do we come up with that? How do we decide that these 66 are the word of God? How do we determine that? Well, there's a threefold criteria that was used ultimately to determine in the early church that these were the scriptures. In the Old Testament, they were those scriptures that had been accepted and read in the temple for, for so many years, written only at the, at the end of the age of the prophets. Anything written after the prophets was not seen as holy scripture. And that became what we now know, or at least in our Protestant Bible, the 39 books of the Old Testament. But then the New Testament had a threefold criteria to be accepted as, in fact, part of the, what's called canon of Scripture. Canon was the word that actually meant read, which is a measuring stick. And, and the canon of Scripture was based upon, first, was it written by an apostle or a close apostolic ally? Second, was it fully accepted and read in all of the first and second century churches? And third, is the content consistent with what was widely accepted as, here's a word, orthodox theology or theology that was basic and foundational to what we believe as Christians? If those three criteria were there, it was ultimately determined that God included those in the canon of Scripture. And the canon was then considered closed by three councils, different councils of the church in the late 300s. 
And that's what gave us our Bible. Now, the Lord, let's make, make sure we understand, the Lord allowed the church to recognize that these were his inspired words for humanity, for us to know him, to know about him and how to live for him. And the church then was given that ability to receive and ultimately distribute scripture to the churches. And those scriptures are what we still have today. Now, we could go into a long, drawn-out uh, lecture on how all of those scriptures were validated and how close we have uh, today to exactly the manuscripts that have been found throughout our... We could do all of that, but ultimately, I want to give you that basis on how they were chosen, and that's the main point that Paul ultimately makes to Timothy. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, he says. So these 66 books in the Bible are the foundation of our truth and our morals, what we believe and how we live. It's essential that you grasp that reality if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. And that's why we spend so much time reading it and studying it and discussing it, because to know what God wants us to believe about him is in these words, and to know what, how God wants us to respond to the gospel message of Jesus Christ is in these words. Now, here's the problem for some. Uh, they don't like some of the truths of the Bible, so they create their own truth by defining terms that support their view of the truth, their desired truth. So, for instance, Paul already addresses that. This is not some new phenomenon. If you fast forward a little bit to chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, here's what he says to Timothy. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Now, now, trust me, you can absolutely find a teacher or preacher who will tell you exactly what you want to hear. I mean, we have the internets. I always make it plural for fun. You can find a church or a preacher or a teacher online that will either interpret the Bible through the filter of culture or they will make it say whatever you want it to say. They're there. Or you can find a preacher teacher that'll just ignore the hard teachings of the Bible because they don't want to offend you. So, so let me just not talk about those passages because I want you to be my friend. Sorry, you came to the wrong place if you're looking for those kind of teachers. And that's why we start with the scriptures. That's why we read them and then seek to unpack them so we know what God has to say to us as the church and to us as a generation and as a community. We want to first unpack what it meant for the people who first received it in the language that it was written to them in and understanding the cultural biases that were there that he was trying to address. That is the truth we discover, and then we apply it to our lives today. You know, it's, it's interesting as I look at my college experience, both my undergrad and some graduate work that I did at Ohio University, um, the difference between a math class and a political science class. I had both. Now, I never one time remember in any of my math classes someone raising their hand to argue the formula that the professor was using. Oh, but in political science, lots of hands going up. Lot of debate happening in there. Why is that? Well, because for math, the formulas are clear, and they've been used over and over again throughout history. But in political science, you have lots of difference of opinion as to what is good and best and right for a community. And it's interesting, the same is true in our faith. So many differing religions out there. I mean, if we were here in a comparative religions course and I started talking, I mean, the hands could start going up. 
and we could see the differences. And because of that, we need a source of truth. God knew this, and it's why he gave us his word. How do we know it's true? Well, because we start with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If I ultimately can conclude that the evidence is there that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then I can begin to understand why this word was given to us in truth. He first validated all that we have in the Old Testament, and those who walked with him and witnessed his resurrection are the ones who wrote the New Testament for us to discover the truth about him. Jesus and the apostles validate this word that we have today. And if I don't have a source for truth, I'm left only to my own upbringing, biases, relationships, and subjectively decide to determine what is true and false. I'm just winging it, in other words, when I don't have a source of truth. Now look, some of the Bible is disagreed on among believers. I get that. We understand that. But very little among the core beliefs of the Christian faith are debated, very few. Because the reality is, these are central beliefs that ultimately help us unpack the rest of it. And once we establish those core beliefs, now we can establish that the Bible is our source for truth and life. And in the Christian faith, we see this as not just a guide, but an authority for what is true. And that's why we have the Bible as our first core value here at Southland. It's what everything else is built upon. It's the foundation of all we believe, all we teach, and it's the foundation as to what we try to live by, what is right and wrong. Now, let's read it again. Verse 16 all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. You see, this is the hard part for some people. Scripture is not only the authority for truth, but it's actually the authority for what not to do, what we should not be doing in our lives. Now, it's interesting, the NIV translates rebuking us. I mean, you showed up today and said, I hope he rebukes me. Please rebuke me. But, but this is what he says, it's a very valuable part of our life to be rebuked, corrected, when we are wrong. And that is why we need an authority like the scriptures. Without this authority, we're left to establish our morals based on personal whims, desires, pleasures, and the survival of the fittest and what is simply popular as a view today. In other words, the, the, the morality, the winds of morality are changing all the time, and I just hop on the bird and fly with them. And that's not what we should be living by. If we're honest, we can be a little defensive when someone comes and challenges our behaviors, can't we? I, I have. I have been. But ultimately, we don't like it, but where do we go to find out whether or not they're right about us? Have you ever noticed that eight out of the ten commandments tell you what not to do? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, God's the bulk of his big ten our stuff we're not supposed to do. Apparently, we would have had a propensity to do those things. And so he says, no, those aren't the life that I designed for you. Our spirits and our personal will, men and women, are infected by rebellion against God. And this word, we call it sin. It's a bent to do the wrong thing. And so he often tells us in his word these are the things that should not be in your life. You should run from those things. See, God gives us scripture to know what isn't 
part of his design for the human experience? What isn't part of his plan for your life? Now, what he understands about the human experience is that left on our own, we would do things that hurt ourselves and others that are not best for us, that he never intended for us because the human race is broken by sin. And as a result, we can begin to accept things that God never intended for us because the voices in our culture are so much louder than what we allow God to speak to us through Scripture. It's why we both read it and study it, and then ultimately on top of that, discuss it and apply it. So the Lord gives us Scripture to awaken us to this reality. Not only so we have the instruction to not do something, but so we also can discover if we have done something wrong, we can confess it, admit to it, and repent of it or change our minds about it, turn from that thing. There's a lot of things in God's word that will enlighten you or awaken you to sin in your life. It's why it's there. And again, if we're honest, often our inclinations are to be self-serving. In other words, I want to please myself. I want to chase after my own ideas. And if God's word doesn't agree with me, well, then too bad for him. But this corruption of our character creates confusion in our personal will. So what we think will make us happy and fulfilled and successful is sometimes the opposite of what God intended for us all along. The God who loves you, by the way. Scripture brings us back to realize it, admit it, and adjust because of it. And that's why Paul says, all Scripture is inspired by God, it is useful to teach us what is true, and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Now look, I get it. Uh, it, It's no longer a a well-accepted thing to tell someone what's wrong in their life. Uh, and, and, And I would just simply say to you, that's why I pick up the Bible every week, because I don't want you arguing with me. If you want to have an argument about this, I want you to be arguing with what the Lord says about it. You'll always win an argument against me, I promise. But I don't think you want to argue with him. As Christ followers who are infected by sin, we often get it wrong, and fortunately, his word is here to help us when that happens. Sure, our pride and stubbornness can cause us to want to refuse his correction. And trust me, you have the choice whether or not you want to do that. You can make up your mind to refuse his instruction, or you can embrace this gift of correction and make the adjustments to recalibrate your will to his will for you. Because I just want to encourage you, his will can be trusted a whole lot more than your will. You see, I find it interesting in talking to people as they try to wrap their heads around this because they don't like some of the things the Bible has to say. And they want to have their own standard of authority. They want to have their own personal authority over their morals. And so what can happen is something like this. Um, Let's say that I'm homeless and I don't have any way to buy food for my family. And so I make a decision. I see you walking down the street and you look like you're well-appointed and probably have some money on you. So I decide to come up to you and attack you and steal all of your money and leave you bleeding in the street. Now, some would say, well, you did that out of a sympathetic or empathetic heart for your family. You knew you had to take care of them. You were desperate, and you knew that person had what you needed to help your family, and so you went ahead and attacked them and stole from them. Now, what tells us that is wrong? His word. His word says, I know there are going to be severe pressures in your life, massive challenges. 
You're going to begin to question how things are going to be provided for, how you're going to deal with it. But I'm here to tell you, attacking someone and stealing from them is not the solution to your problem. And yet there are those today that would say empathy is the foundational authority for all the choices that you would make. And while that sounds very noble, that I have great compassion and concern for other people, ultimately we need an authority to how to deal with the immense challenges that come with living in a fallen and broken world. And that's why he gives us his world, his word. But the Bible goes beyond correction to help us know how to apply truth to our everyday lives. Look at verse 17 again. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. You see, not only is it an authority on what is true and not only is it an authority on what not to do, but scripture is the authority on what to do, how to live our lives. We can get the notion sometimes that the Bible is just a list of all the fun things God doesn't want us to do that he's just wagging his long, bony, judgmental finger at us, saying he's waiting for us to blow it. And that's not really what the majority of the Bible is about. The truth is, the Bible actually provides way more guidance as to what we can do with our lives, what we should do with our lives. And that's what Paul was inspired to let you know, that this word equips and prepares you to discover and accomplish God's plan for your life so that you can do, here's what he called it, every good work. Everything that he's laid out for you to accomplish, here it is, for his glory. And that by trusting this word that he has given to you, you ultimately are showing him faith, trust, in your obedience, you're declaring to him that he is, in fact, your God, and better yet, your Lord, your leader. And he leads you to do wonderful things. That's why he reminds Timothy that his job is to communicate this message, both the things you are to do and the things you're not supposed to do to his congregation and to his community, whether or not they want to hear it or receive it. That's his job. In it, you'll find wisdom, direction, empowerment, and a strategy, and promises that he gives you the resource to accomplish that strategy of his glory in your life. It ultimately records Christ's commission to all of us who would call ourselves followers of him, the fourth G, to go and to be his ambassadors, to be his mouthpiece in your culture, in your bubble of influence. This is what he commands us to do. You know, I, I, interesting, I was listening recently to uh, Francis Chan speaking in the Philippines, talking about disagreeing with the Bible. And I love what he said. Chan said, if I disagree with something in God's word, I just assume that I'm wrong. Now, let me say it again. If I disagree with something in God's word, I assume that I'm wrong. I assume he's smarter than me. I assume he's wiser than me. I assume that he understands what he intended to do when he created the human experience on this earth. And if I choose to disagree with the word he has given us, then there's something wrong with me, people. And maybe you have that same testimony. Some people have the self-confidence to believe that they can serve as their own authority on truth and morals. They don't realize how influenced they are by culture, upbringing, education, media, entertainment, we think we're thinking for ourselves, but then we realize how incredibly influenced we are by so many streams in our culture. As I pursue my life's purpose, my ambitions, my calling, Scripture is the foundation for my morals and my truth. 
And this is what we believe at Southland. When we come together, you may hear something that doesn't sit well with your cultural ideas, your philosophies of life, or the things that all of your friends think are right and good and best. But ultimately, our job here is to read and unpack this word, not only so we can know it, but so that we can live it. Many shifts have happened among the world's cultures in the last 20 years, not that long ago. Why? Because the world is not basing their morals and values on any kind of authoritative foundation. It's the whims of feeling. The current guiding principle is, if you feel it, it's your truth, go live your truth. Well, for the Christ follower, you can get caught up in that way of thinking, and you can lose sight of God's design. I mean, it can happen to you if you aren't absorbing his voice, his word, into your mind and spirit. Christ followers have a foundation the Bible. It just told us that scriptures equip you to do what God wants you to do, to do every good work he's planned for you, to live your life, to honor him, worship him, and give him glory. So I remind you from back at our 2 Timothy series when we talked about this passage, three things happen to us with the word. First, we learn it with our head. That's the intellectual part. And then we choose it with our will, whether or not we are going to believe it. And then thirdly, we live it with obedience, the physical response to saying, not only have I learned it, and not only have I believed it, but I'm going to submit myself to its leadership of my life. And that's why I won't be conducting any polygamous marriages in this sanctuary because Scripture clearly tells me what a marriage looks like and polygamy is not it. And that is is why I'm, I'm reluctant to even give one example like that because I don't want it to become just about that. I want it to become about you and I seeing this word as the authority of our life, the light of our life, and our window into the truth and morals of God. And that's the reason we build our beliefs and teaching upon Scripture here at Southland, because we want to follow Christ the way God wants us to follow Christ. Now, uh, Atlanta pastor Andy Stanley was talking about this actually a few weeks ago. And he said it this way. You get to choose whether or not you will follow Jesus. You do not get to decide what following Jesus looks like, acts like, sounds like, or reacts like. It has been prescribed for us. We have been told what it looks like, acts like, sounds like, and reacts like. So we're not just all deciding on our own what the definition of love is or what the definition of following Jesus is or what the definition of a Christian is. He has defined it for us. And as followers of Jesus, we are seeking to follow him the way he has prescribed it. And where have we been told what it looks like, acts like, sounds like, and reacts like? The Bible, the scriptures the word of God. And to follow Jesus, we must know what the scripture says Jesus is all about, what he looks like, what he acts like, what he sounds like, and how he reacts. And in doing that, we have discovered the will of God for all of us. Men and women, Southland, builds everything on the Word of God. I pray you will be able to trust him enough to do the same in your life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for speaking to our generation through your Word. 
Thank you for the reality of that moment when you rose from the dead and made your sacrifice on the cross real and powerful. And now, O oh Lord, we ask that you will help us to believe. Help us to want to read this word. Help us to want to live our lives by your instruction. We pray your Holy Spirit would seal this moment to our hearts where we commit ourselves to your leadership. We declare to you today in this prayer, we will submit to your lordship and we will submit to your word. You pray your own prayer in response to what you heard today, asking the Lord to reveal his truth to you. You pray. us to know, thus saith the Lord. That's what we want more than anything, to know what you have to say in our lives. So thank you for awakening us to this today. I pray that as people are praying their own prayers and dealing with your voice, that you're helping people to see areas of their life that are wrong and need corrected. That you're helping all of us to see areas in our mind that need corrected. And in all of it, we pray you would empower us to give you glory in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's respond to what we've heard today by singing this song with all of our heart. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to online. Thank you so much for being here in worship with us today. I hope you'll stick around for just a minute so you can hear a little more about how you can respond to what you experienced in worship at Southland today. We're so glad you're part of it. Looking forward to the day you can be back together with us in person. God bless you. Have a great week. We hope to see you next week.